our, our discussion now, introduce our, our other panellists. Um, Michael Coots Trotter is the Secretary of the New South Wales Department of Family and Community Services and Chair of Their Futures Matter Implementation Board. Kate Connors is Acting Deputy Secretary of Justice Strategy and Policy in the New South Wales Department of Justice and represents Justice on Their Futures Matter Implementation Board. And joining them are two people we met earlier today, Michael Chalmers, you'd remember from this morning's keynote, Director for Children and Families in the Scottish Government, and uh, of course, Elizabeth Murphy up here today. Is Michael, oh, there you are. So we, it's a chance for you to ask some questions. I thought I'd just begin though, and I, I wanted to start with you, Elizabeth, just on this whole idea. You said, look, risk is not destiny, but almost everything laid out there would suggest that would suggest that it is. Um, how do you overcome that if you have a bad beginning to life? Are you doomed to an early death, psychological problems, you know, an inability to sort of hold down a job or to get a proper education? How do you reverse that um, if, if the first couple of years of life are so traumatic? It's good you took notice of my advice to not take it personally. <laughs> I'm just I'm trying, I'm looking for any hints here, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I ticked almost every single box <laughs> in the first two. I'm sure my dad won't mind me sharing this, but he was behind bars when I was born. So, um, so you, you know, should, we never you had should, a home. I so you should be answering this question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you what, I, I never felt as if I wasn't in it, you know, we were in a very tough upbringing and in poverty and, and itinerant and sporadic education, but always felt incredibly loved in the family. Mm. Um, and, uh, and stimulated in, a, in other ways. You know, education is a, a lifelong thing and it happens in different ways. But, but, but within my family and within my extended family who all experience similar up upbringings, are all of those things that you outlined. And that's Early resilience. death, um, yeah. Yeah. So, look, it is, it is very difficult because this is, is fairly new research and how we apply it is going to be um, interesting. But to give you an example, at a practical physical level, if you take an ACE score, if a paediatrician takes an ACE score of, uh, before they see a child, then it may be that they need to act on the environment, on the child protection environment, but the child might be coming in with asthma. Now, automatically, you need to put extra uh, mechanisms in for as far as that's concerned. If a 40-year-old is coming in with um, chest pain, mm. and if you take a, an ACE story and find out that that, that adult had adverse childhood experiences, then you should be working far more aggressively on, on that particular clinical scenario than you would otherwise. But is that to, is, that's after the event, someone's yep. already, what do you do knowing what we know now for yep. someone who may have had a bad beginning to life in their sort of early teens or preteens, are there things you can start to work yep. on to reverse and that? I, I think that's this whole project of their futures matter. That is exactly what this is about. And everything that we're doing in health and working with other agencies is trying to identify and support families earlier so that we can make those, um, we can either prevent or get early intervention and support and make a different outcome as a result of that. Mm. So that's what this conference is about. You didn't touch, uh, so you couldn't spend a lot of time on this, but you know, I've done a lot of reading around epigenetics and uh, there's some fantastic material written, particularly among um, Jewish families and Jewish Holocaust surviving families. And, and I think they're applicable to indigenous communities, refugee communities, people who've experienced uh, trauma in their lives on a, on a massive scale and the intergenerational effects of that. And for some of you who may be not aware that the uh, part of the intergenerational epigenetic inheritance is that it, those stories, what happened to your grandparents or even great grandparents can actually distort your own DNA. It can, it can um, stifle the development of particular sort of, you know, genes that, that impact adversely on your health. One of the things that people have found is that the stories we tell about ourselves are crucial. 
Um, there was a, a Jewish writer who once said that her, her parents' memories mattered more than her own. And it wasn't until she started to change the story she told of herself that she started to find a way through this. How important is that story of our lives and what we prioritise and what we focus on and the framing an identity free of suffering and trauma? How important is that and how actively should we be engaged in that storytelling process, both in our lives and, and uh, at a societal level? It is critical and um, you are right about the intergenerational stories. There is some good research with the Canadian um, children that were sent to the IRS, the residential mm. schools, and their the grandchildren have inculcated the same terrible stories as well and that's been replicated um, based on the similar things that it had Jewish people in concentration camps. So. I suppose it's all new information, and but we've always known that stories are important. And I think that that is something that hopefully this first 2,000 days framework will, will amplify. Mm. Michael, what about in New South Wales, the work that's being done now around early intervention and prevention, identifying and how quickly and how early can you identify that potential risk uh, to stop or to, to minimise some of the impact of this, of this trauma in the early stages of, of life and that early development years? Um, can I just, just take your yeah. previous question as well? Um, there are people in the room who might have experience of 12-step fellowships. I do. And 12-step fellowships are a great example of how people um, retell their own story in a way that provides meaning and creates purpose. So it's by sharing stories of your own addiction to gambling or alcohol and other drugs that you are able to offer something of use to other people. And you are talking about your own life in a way that turns chaos and humiliation and disappointment into something of use to other people. And I think, you know, there is incredible power in that, in finding meaning and purpose. And I think people faced with very similar external stresses, largely poverty, either do or don't find meaning and purpose. And people who can, can face down those stresses. And sometimes people who can't are just overwhelmed by them. Mm. To your second point, well, the data would tell us who's most at risk in what circumstances um, at a increasingly specific level. Uh, that's, but also recognising that Elizabeth's point, that risk is not destiny, it's simply risk. What we lack is a really solid body of evidence about what's likely to work best in response to some but not all of that. We've got good evidence for some of it, but we are in the process of building evidence for the rest of it. But it was really interesting to hear Michael talk earlier about children growing up in poverty because I think in Australia we tend to conceive of parenting as something that is natural. You're either born to it or you're not, um, rather than a set of skills and a set of skills that are influenced by the environment in which you are trying to care for children. And poverty um, creates extraordinary stresses that make it very difficult for people to meet the challenges of raising children. And I think we do have to have a talk about not just the specific, the child, the family, but people will only do as well as their community and our society allows. Mm. Um, so there are some really big things that have to be tackled, but there's increasingly good evidence about where there are opportunities for us to act earlier Act, act in a way that's likely to be effective and also for the taxpayer, act in a way that's likely to cost a lot less. And Michael, I'll just stay with you on, on this point too. We're hearing a lot about data today and you know, we had a, a great discussion in our, our breakout session around the way that data is used, the way it's collected, the ethics around that collection, uh, the, the context in which that data is applied. When we're talking about something like this, the early years and the impact of trauma, um, 
Take, for instance, our Aboriginal communities where there is overwhelmingly represented in all of the negative aspects of this data, and yet there are also socioeconomic aspects to that that are not necessarily tied specifically to Aboriginal identity. Um, how do you how do you contextualise that data? What do you prioritise in trying to approach something like this, where not all Aboriginal communities are going to be the same, and there may be commonalities among socioeconomic groups beyond particular ethnic or identity-based groups. So interpreting data and contextualising that and prioritising that, where are we at in, in being able to do that in well, a discerning we, way? You, you could look at objective data about um, the population, health, prosperity, well-being of Aboriginal communities, and you could look at that as a deficit, or you could look at that and go, despite all the things that have happened in 231 years, Nine out of ten Aboriginal children are living safe and well at home. Mm. So the data, which is a story we don't which, hear, no, in terms and, of the story we tell ourselves. Yeah. So the the data is the data, but obviously we all then bring a whole range of preconceptions to it uh, that can fundamentally affect what we do in response to the data. Can fundamentally affect how. Uh, how effective collectively we are, because the moment you start talking about deficit and vulnerability, I think you're, you're heading down the wrong track. It's very difficult not to do that, but I mm. think the moment you start doing that, you're heading down the wrong track. Everyone needs help with child raising. Um, many of us are able to get that in quite informal ways, but some of us need to rely on specialist or intensive services. Um, but the moment we start thinking of it as vulnerability and that's not us, I think we are starting to misunderstand the benefits we all get from supporting everybody's child raising. Kate, how much of a predictor uh, is some of the early uh, stress in terms of coming into contact later with the justice system? If, you, if you're born into those circumstances, are you more likely to end up in pro with problems with the law? Um, this, so to, to echo all the, the themes that you've had today, so the single biggest predictor um, of a young person's contact with the justice system is, is um, erratic parenting. So parenting styles that are sort of alternatively authoritarian or then lax, child neglect, all of those are the biggest um, in indicators that then, and also sort of child neglect, obviously, that leads to all the things like disengagement with school and all of those other things that can be protective factors for your contact with the justice system. So this is... Um, incredibly important and I think it's been a bit of a shift in I think in justice sometimes we've tended to think um, we're at the end of the road and where other agencies have mm. failed we now um, you know receive people as our, our clients and I think there's a much more active role for for justice in engaging in these early intervention projects because we understand that the, the criminogenic factors fit as well with the other kind of um, you know, elements of social disadvantage that be experienced by children who've had adverse childhood experiences. Where are you at now with being able to intervene, um, being able to identify people potentially at risk and being able to intervene? And is there a, an optimal age that you can do that? If someone gets into their teens, is that too late? Look, to some extent, I think we would hate to say it's too late to some extent it is, and the earlier a young person has contact with the justice system, the more likely it is it's going to be repeat contact. But we are now, um, I suppose, seeing um, the justice role as more of an integrated approach, more of a human services approach. So we've got programs like Youth on Track, which is designed to identify kids who are just at starting contact. And instead of sort of only having a kind of justice response to them, some more of a wraparound service response and also engaging with their family. So trying to then deal with what might be happening at home that might be part of what's contributing to the offending behaviour. So trying to use those early points as a, an intervention point, not just about um, uh, stopping crime, but also about making, that, making their, their personal circumstances better. But if you're already dealing with people who are in really tough circumstances, they're vulnerable and the yeah. family networks and, and support structures are not there. What's your entry point? How do you do that? How do you, I mean, is this a, again, you get down to this thing of intervention. Is it intervention um, against the wishes of the family? How do you bring the, the family and the, and the community with you on this? Look, I think that is a, it's a, that's a difficult entry point, I suppose, for us as, as, as justice, because we are a, a department with which people don't have 
they don't come to us. They don't have. They're not. They don't wish to be our clients. They don't. We don't have a kind of a support. But but there are other agencies. But there are other agencies, and that's why that part exactly. That's why that partnership approach is so important. And we. I mean, we have a kind of a couple of pilots that are about having all the agencies work together so that when people are getting a justice response, they're also getting their their other needs met by having health and facts and education work with us to do a whole of family response to their issues. And I think we also have to see ourselves to. Um, uh, our role with, with parents as well, because obviously having a parent who's incarcerated or a parent who's had repeated contact with the justice system is a very um, serious risk factor for young people. And the fact um, we probably, I think it would be fair to say, offer very little about supporting parents who are, who are incarcerated or parents who are leaving jail and how do you sort of do more of a through care. We're now starting to really think about the through care of people exiting jail and how that you do sort of family supports because that's obviously a very risky time for that family and you know and that offender as well. Mm. Michael Chalmers, just listening to this, um, I was thinking about the your um, illustration this morning and seeing the balls dropping down, and you can identify where these groups are and and the children that are potentially vulnerable. Listening um, to what you've heard here, does that? resonate with what you find in, in Scotland as well, that the same types of experiences in early childhood are, uh, you, repeat, you see the same problems later in life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, first of all, I'm just slightly embarrassed that when I rattled off our various pro, you know, policies in Scotland supporting um, children and families, I didn't mention that we're going to become the first Aces Aware nation. So <laughs> I didn't realise that was coming up later. So I suppose that illustrates that we're, we're right behind um, behind the ACES agenda and, and what that tells us. And I think the great thing about that is how it's probably given, um, I think what you would call your practitioners, we would describe as social workers, you know, what social workers have known from practice for 30 or 40 years now has some clinical evidence and it makes that conversation with health professionals that bit easier to say this is not just about our gut or our instinct or our professional experience, it's actually, it's, it's science. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say about ACEs was, and you were asking what, what we do in response, you know, the kind of classic way to, to illustrate the, the trauma-informed question is, is to ask, um, you know, not what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you. Mm. And I think that really tells us something about how we can help support people who've gone through traumatic experiences in a way that's going to be more supportive and helpful. But all of this discussion, I think, resonates with the, the challenges we've got in Scotland, um, thinking just about the justice questions. and and the entry point for families who, who are engaged with the criminal justice system. You know, you do have a captive audience there. Um, so parenting services and support for families, you, you, you do have a way in because lots of people who are incarcerated will have, will have families and, will, and maintaining those links with families is helpful to that next generation and doing that in a structured way and a supportive way is something we're trying to do in Scotland and we're far from, we're far from having cracked it, but it's something we're working on. Um, and I think as well, the numbers we've had in our Scottish prisons of um, uh, women prisoners is, is dropping drastically because many of these women prisoners have families. And again, you're, you're only perpetuating the cycle if in response to um, uh, behaviours, you're, you're, you're locking women up because that doesn't really do mm. a great deal for the wider environment uh, in, which they, in which you're um, plucking them or from which you're plucking them. Um, but parenting skills, I think, is absolutely something where I was interested in, in the discussion about, let me, was it love, love Talk, Sing, Read, Play? So we have a similar program, but it's just um, Play, Talk, Read. So I don't know whether that's <laughs> inadequate or maybe it's just says something about the Scottish psyche. Uh, you know, so, so I think we're, we're very much aligned. It's really heartening to hear that we're thinking about the same stuff and it'd be great to continue to learn from what, what I'm hearing here in New South Wales. I just want to open up to questions in just a minute. But one of the things that's been very, I think, a, a theme that I've picked up on today is that there's a lot of work in identifying vulnerabilities um, and then creating entry points for intervention. What about empowerment and agency of people rather than seeing them as people who need intervention or who are vulnerable or this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. How do you build agency and empowerment in communities and in families who may be experiencing this stress? What's your experience in Scotland? So I think that's a really well, well um, put question because 
Um, dealing with stigma is, is absolutely critical, I think, to providing support for families. And it goes back to what I was saying this morning about doing things with families and not to them. So I mentioned the nursery um, that I went to last week in, in a deprived community. I don't like using that term, but it, for, for shorthand. Um, and, and they have all sorts of ways in which to support families. So they have parenting groups, they have um, singing sessions with the children, they have um, exchanges for essentially food banks. The way in which they do that is that you can bring along food as well as take food away, so it destigmatizes. And I think what's been quite positive about the experience in Scotland is going around different parts of the country, there's different community-led activities that work the best. And so part of my job is, is not to get in the way of that, um, to set a kind of national policy, but not to get in the way of the things that come from the ground up. Because if I go around the country and say, OK, this is working quite well in Ayrshire, we'll pick this up and we'll drop it in in a highland community, it's, it's not going to work because it's imposed. Yeah. So I think allowing that space for community-led um, uh, activity is critical. And thinking about ways that supports but doesn't impose is, is also critical to avoiding stigma. Michael Kuchor, could you speak to that as well in New South Wales about where the emphasis is? Is it in intervention or empowerment and where that line is drawn? I mean, where those things may in fact connect. You may be able to intervene and empower people at the same time. I think at the present, by and large, it's closer to intervention than empowerment. And we're trying very hard to shift it towards empowerment, which is why uh, we are such big fans of the first 2000 days framework and strategy, because it provides the platform for the rest of government and the non-government sector, I hope, um, to begin to kind of reorientate ourselves to provide general specialist and intensive support in a non-stigmatizing, proportionate, responsive way to families who need it at different points. Um, at the moment, far too often, you have to escalate into statutory child protection crisis to have the whole system respond to provide what you need. and. Um, that's just inadequate. Um, it, it, uh, it, it's a huge price for children and families. It's a huge price for people working in the statutory system and our partners in the non-government sector. No, nobody's, nobody's comfortable with it. We want to change it. Elizabeth, just before we go to questions, how, what is, what's the level of awareness around this? Uh, you know, uh, I've read a lot about it and I've experienced it and I'm you know, interested in what you had to say here, but how aware are people about the impact of those first 2,000 days and how much work is done with, um, with families and communities in creating that level of awareness? In health, a lot. <laughs> but um, I, I, I don't... Oh, that's a hard question because I think the whole... If you ask me how much people are aware of how important they are without the caption of first 2,000 days. I think intuitively people must have always understood that. Um, but that's why I put up that slide about, you know, the government health goals and targets. Mm. This is new science, and um, but it's the evidence just keeps on layered on top of layers on top of layers as to how important this is. And I think that what we need to do is make sure, and our first objective is that everybody understands how important that is, because you would make choices perhaps that would be different mm. if you understood, personal choices, if mm. you knew how important this was and how lifelong it would be. Um, we, I think that the system that we have with our Child and Family Health Service, with the centres in every locality, um, with a universal health home visit often, the parenting groups, and, and often we know that people who met at that period of time are their own social health support structure and still meeting fortnightly, supporting them, so their parents while the children are going through adolescence. So we've got a lot of wonderful infrastructure here in New South Wales and, and indeed in Australia. It's often not recognised as such because um, it's maybe because it's always been there, because it's always been available. Um, and But I don't think we should underestimate our existing underpinning service. 
um, because it is there and it is available. And I think we've done so much better now in networking between the other agencies, um, working with education and, and community services, our child wellbeing units linking in and, and community services. We've changed our developmental surveillance, so it's one that it's a language that speaks more to other agencies, so everybody can know whether a child is challenged with their development. If you, it's now translated into 18 languages, so we're not ignoring another community. Everything that we're doing is trying to work towards that, but I feel now that we've launched the policy, we're gonna get some great resources as well, and to work within that framework so that that it, there is a much better understanding. Mm. Um, microphones, do we have microphones? Yeah, there's microphones at the back here. If anyone wants a question, you can raise your hand and we can get a microphone to you. Anyone have a, there's one right down the front. You're gonna come all the way down to start. <laughs> Hi there, and Annette from the Parenting Research Centre. This is just adding to the conversation about what we know about parents and what they know about the importance of the early years. And I'm just gonna ask Catherine Wade to just say something. We did a big survey of uh, parents in Victoria, Parenting Today in Victoria. So we've got some data from Victorian parents. I'm not sure exactly what data you want me to talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so yeah. We, <laughs> Uh, three years ago, we ran uh, the first wave of a survey, a representative survey of Victorian parents, um, funded by the Department of Education and Training in Victoria. Um, and we have some amazing uh, findings from that uh, across a whole range of areas. But I think what Annette's directing me to, to talk about is um, some of the data that was revealed about the importance of the early years. Um, and really, this was a survey of parents, the first survey of its kind of that sort of scale. We surveyed 40% of the sample was fathers, which was fantastic for the first time. We have such a, a large and representative view of, of fathers. But um, what it really did tell us was that, that uh, parents are seeking information. They're looking for information about parenting. Um, sometimes they're going to good sources. Uh, often they're going online. 79% of the sample that we spoke to were we're looking online for information, uh, but that that early parenting years, the early parenting stages when children were preschool and when they're in that uh, two th two, first 2000 day period is really when they're, uh, it's, it's a ripe time for seeking parenting information and, and looking for the right sorts of support. So there's a real opportunity for us, and that's just Victoria, but it, there's no reason why we wouldn't think it would be uh, wouldn't be the same across other states and territories in Australia. But that tells us that there's a real opportunity now to get the messaging right and to get the information into the hands of parents um, at that critical time. Okay, can I just ask you, how do people feel about that information gathered in that context being used in other contexts or in a broader uh, all of government sort of approach? Is, are there sensitivities and ethics around the gathering of that information in that particular context and used elsewhere? Uh, good question. Um, it's not something that we ask, ask the parents and certainly the Department of Education and Training who funded this, the survey would be thrilled to, to find out that we're sharing this information with an Australian audience and New South Wales audience and international audience. Um, and certainly this is something, these types of surveys I think are really important and we're trying to get a, a few more of these sorts of surveys across Australia and other jurisdictions. In fact, we're, um, we're talking to the federal government about doing an Australia-wide survey as well. Um, because I think, and particularly when you think about contexts like the Northern Territory and remote parts of Australia, there would be reasons for us to expect that there would be some differences in the parenting experiences um, of other, of other uh, parents in other contexts. So I think it is really important for us to have this baseline understanding of, of what's going on for parents across the age range. Age range. Um, you know, we surveyed parents from, of children from zero to 18 years of age. So we do have a very good uh, breadth of data. I feel like I'm advertising now. I don't, no, that's good. I don't know if that's what you wanted me to do with it. That's great. There was a question at the back here as well. Yes, thank you. Or a comment. Uh, my name's Alyssa Cassidy. I'm with Justice Health with the Teen Got It program. So it's um, early intervention with the young people in the AVO space. 
Um, so I, my, my question is directed at Michael Chalmers. Firstly, thank you for coming and sharing your insights with us. It was really valuable. I'd really love to hear a little bit more about the named person role and how that works um, mm. within the care coordination role and what your experience has been of how the named person navigates um, services for young people and children and whether there's been difficulties and challenges with um, ensuring collaboration and ensuring that the named person is across service provision for, for children and young people. Good question. Michael? Yes, yeah, this one? Yeah, this works. Um, yeah, thanks for that. So the named person service I suppose the reason I didn't say a huge amount about it this morning is because of the legal challenge that I mentioned. So, so we legislated um, to, to, in order to allow information sharing between agencies with the named person. So the idea was that the named person, every child that's in, up to the age of um, 16 has, has a named person appointed. So it's a point of contact for families or children. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's usually a health visitor up to, the, up to school age and then it would be the head teacher. Um, but that was challenged in court because of the information sharing provisions. So we have a bill before the Scottish Parliament at the moment that seeks to address the, the, um, the, the grounds for the challenge. So that's, so that's sort of to be, to be determined. What we have is a kind of um, uh, system in place without legislation, which is, which is less um, uh, wide in its scope so that it's essentially something it operates different in different differently in different parts of Scotland but essentially it's on a consent basis so you're offered the service where a named person could navigate services on your behalf um, and link up services but it's 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 only um, it's only an offer it's not something that's a universal service so the real challenges are around information sharing that's that's kind of where we've we've run into some difficulties but we're trying to resolve them is that it, it, it's very helpful. I, I guess I wondered um, how you see that working with per perhaps the school teacher being the named person and maybe their knowledge of services and, and potentially the services that that young person could be eligible for and would benefit from, but also um, particularly where young people maybe aren't engaged with education or, or a little bit disengaged from that, um, what occurs with, with those young people? Yeah, so there's obviously training and guidance um, rolled out by, by Scottish Government to support the named person providers. So principal, as I say, that would be head teachers and, and health visitors. So that was quite a sort of big suite of work we had to do to you know, provide the proper support so the named person would know where to go to if, for example, they wanted to contact the GP or, or make contact with other services um, that the, the child or young person could engage with. And what was the second part, sorry, of your... Uh, where young people aren't engaged in education, where they're disengaged. Yeah, there, there, there were, were other people other than teachers, weren't there? That could be named person. There could be other. Agencies. Yeah, it would norm if it's a school age person, it would normally be the teacher. But then the teacher would obviously know if that young person wasn't attending school. There would be a record of that. So, that, so that could be a trigger, for example, to make contact with other services, social services, for example. So it's a kind of supported network. It's not just something that's imposed on professionals without there being guidance and support as to how to, to perform the role. Thank you. Yes, one here. Thank you. My name's Samantha Lukey. I'm from the University of Wollongong and it's more kind of a research question. And it's to you, um, sorry, Elizabeth, and to Michael Chalmers. And it's about the ACE studies. So. Were you saying, Elizabeth, that you're going to be rolling out the ACE questionnaire essentially across the population? Is that...? No, sorry. No, no I wasn't okay. saying that. Um, okay. uh, that um, so the ACE study is underpinning the evidence yes. of our framework of the first 2,000 days. Okay. Um, sorry? Oh, I, I guess I was curious because I, with the work that I do, I used it with about 80 students last year and what I discovered was there there are a couple of elements that are missing so it doesn't talk about refugee status it also and I'm, I'm working with Aboriginal community doing some research and it's missing fairly significant cultural elements but it also identified or we identified that 
in asking the questions, we need to be thinking about referral pathways. So we have to be really careful about who is actually using it and how they're trained to, to, to be aware of referral pathways, which I guess was the question for you, Michael mm. Chalmers. So, so if, you, have, clarify, you just respond to that and then yeah. Michael. Yeah. Um, in, in New South Wales Health, if we were going to introduce a questionnaire, it would need to go through a hugely rigorous process of meeting um, objective scientific screening criteria, and we haven't done that in any way, shape or form as far as this is concerned. It is a questionnaire that is built on for a research study. However, um, the paediatrician, Nadine Burke-Harris, has started using that in her clinical caseload, um, and she describes that um, she's been promoting that with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I think 3% of pediatricians are beginning to use it. But that is a long way from where we in New South Wales Health would consider this as a public health initiative. So, no, it's, it's if I could just be clear, if I implied that, that was incorrect. It was, it's absolutely because it was a research questionnaire, questionnaire underpinning the ACE study that informed our first 2,000 days framework. Now, can I be clear, you, you, you wanted Michael to respond yes, to which so just part because, of that? Because Scotland is being recognised, well, you're working towards being an ACE, what was it, ACE aware? ACE country? aware. Yes. So how is that being dealt with in Scotland, I guess? Is the Are you, you, you're talking about the, those cultural Well, using, if they're, ace, if they're becoming ace aware, I would be thinking the questionnaire is being used fairly regularly. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, so being an ace aware nation doesn't mean that we're rolling out the questionnaire to the, the general population, if that was your question. We're, we're, what we're doing is informing our policy making so that, for example, trauma-informed approaches to, to engaging with um, users of services would be something we'd roll out. And there's a number of ways in which we're trying to use the evidence that the research has told us to look at ways to improve our engagement. But your point about the different um, ACEs and the score, I think, is really important. Firstly, because what we really want to avoid is people sitting with a checklist and working out the score and saying, well, you're a seven, that means yeah. X or Y. The second lay about the, I think these are, it's almost like proxies. So in Scotland, there's been quite a lot of discussion about whether traumatic bereavement, I don't know if there's any other kind of bereavement, but traumatic bereavement where children, for example, of parents who've, who've um, died from a drug overdose and, and the, the children have seen that, whether that sort of experience should, should count. But I, I expect what the clinicians or, or the, the science, scientists would tell us is that it's not a kind of comprehensive list. These are things which yeah. are clear and common uh, instances of trauma that would indicate the kind of consequences that Elizabeth has set out. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're thank almost you. up for the day, but I do have time for one more. If there's another, oh, there's one right across the other side here. Thank you. <clears throat> My name's Nikki Sloan, and I'm from Community Industry Group. So we're a regional peak body for NGOs in South East New South Wales. Um, and I guess my questions for the two Michaels, I'm, it's been really fascinating today and really interesting. Um, and I'm wondering about the um, tension, or is there any tension between the need for data and the, the push for evidence-based practice and opportunity for innovation? Um, because, you know, they sort of sound a little bit counterintuitive, but sometimes, you know, the only way to develop new programs and new ways of working is to um, trust to innovation and kind of suck it and see. Um, yeah, Michael Chalmers. And, and are you saying that there's... So you have an evidence-based approach based on collection of data, but that shouldn't preclude a more innovative or instinctive approach? Is that... I guess, yeah, I guess I'm worried about um, would that mean that new approaches won't get trialled, um, you know? Will there still be opportunity for innovation out there? Because um, there are some great evidence-based um, uh, programs working, but, you know, there might be people with great ideas that, right. um, you know, that could be doing something different. Yeah. Well, I'll just be quite brief and say that I think there's room for both, absolutely. And if, if you allow innovation, you can then test effectiveness by looking at the, the, the outputs and measuring them and using the evidence to assess 
how effective and an innovative approach has been. Certainly, in my job, as I said before, you know, there's, there's a lot of regional variance within Scotland, so I'm, I'm in the course of doing a, a tour of all the local authorities. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a tough job going, going around Scotland to do that. But, but asking local areas what they're proud of and what they've used that, that works in terms of supporting families and improving outcomes, and it's different stories in different parts of Scotland, so I would certainly encourage innovation. Um, and I, I, we know from our own experience, for example, with functional family therapy, um, we have had providers who have said, well, as I try and deliver this to the model in this context, in this case an Aboriginal context, we're not comfortable with it. We don't think it works for these reasons and there needs to be some adaptation. And there's been quite a bit of back and forth with the model owners um, to recognise precisely that, that uh, while as it's evidence-based or evidence-informed, it happens in a context, and uh, particularly in Aboriginal or Aboriginal contexts, um, you have to be open to uh, the experience of practice. Um, so the, the two are not in conflict, but what I would say, and I'll use an example from education, um, in New South Wales for 30 years, the primary intervention for children whose reading was not up to scratch after a year of schooling was a program called Reading Recovery. And we doubled down on it and we doubled down on it. And then the evidence emerged that it just doesn't work. So there is a moral responsibility where you can to seek and use the evidence because, you know, that's a $50 million, $60 million intervention that for 30 years really didn't make much difference. Thank you so much. Um, a long day. I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, it was fascinating for me just to sit here and listen to a lot of the discussion today. Thank you all for coming and thank you so much to our panel as well. Thank you. Thank you.